appeals in San Francisco heard oral arguments on whether Washington state can ban felons and ex-felons from voting. It was the second time the court heard the case. This is a little more than an hour. Good afternoon. We're here to hear an <coughs> argument in Farrakhan versus Gregoire. Oh, we have uh, Judge Gould appearing by video from Seattle. Good afternoon, Judge Gould. Yes, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, is our counsel ready? Yes, sir. Uh, you may proceed. Good afternoon. May it please the court. I am Ryan Higgett of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund and counsel for the plaintiff's appellants in this action. I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. This is a very rare felon disfranchisement case in which three factors act together to establish liability for vote denial in violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. First, plaintiffs here have established substantial evidence that the pronounced racial disparity in nearly every phase of Washington's criminal justice system cannot be explained away by race-neutral, non-discriminatory factors. Second, the defendants here have failed to offer any alternative explanations for the racial disparities as they exist in the criminal justice system or to contest any aspect of the plaintiff's record which the district court recognized as compelling evidence of racial discrimination in the criminal justice system. Finally, and significantly for purposes of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, the district court recognized that Washington's felon disfranchisement law interacts with racial inequality in the criminal justice system to shift inequality into the political process. Taken together, this is the essence of a Section 2 vote denial claim, where in the totality of the circumstances, a factor that is external to voting interacts with a voting qualification to result in the denial of the right to vote to plaintiffs on account of their race. This is not a case that challenges the general validity of felon disfranchisement laws, nor is it the case that plaintiffs argue that mere statistical disparities alone in felon disfranchisement establish a cause of action under Section 2. Rather, what plaintiffs argue is that Washington's felon disfranchisement law is used as a tool for racial discrimination. Is At any bottom, uh, this rests on a, um, the theory of finding that the entire criminal justice system in the state of Washington is intentionally discriminatory. Uh, against minorities. That, that's not right, Your Honor. What the evidence shows in this case, as the district court found, is that the racial disparity in Washington's criminal justice system arise from and result in discrimination on account of race. So there's no, no, no finding or no contention that there was any intentional discrimination even at the level of the criminal justice system? That's right, Your Honor. What our experts did here This is all in effect. That's right, Your Honor. In fact, when Congress amended Section 2 in 1982, they relieved plaintiffs of the burden of having to prove intentional discrimination. What the evidence shows here, as our experts point to, is that there are racial disparities in Washington's criminal justice system that aren't justified by actual participation of racial minorities in crime. Does the Salt River say that that's not enough? That's right, Your Honor. The Salt River held, as this court knows, that disparities alone are not sufficient. But what's significant here... We'd have to overrule Salt River. You would not, Your Honor, because as, as I, what's significant here is that the district court actually distinguished the evidence proffered in this case from that provided in the Salt River. This court will remember that, that in Salt River, the court was constrained by the party's stipulation to the non-existence of every factor that would lead the court to find racial discrimination. Here, the district court distinguished our evidence from that proffered in Salt River by finding that the disparities in this case arise from and result in discrimination on account of race. So for example... Let, let, me, the, let me just ask you on the issues before the court. I recognize that you come here in a posture of, of having presented substantial and very impressive evidence um, before the district court. Uh, but you are also doing that on a landscape that clearly permitted this kind of a claim to fall within Section 2. So my question now that we're back as an in-bank court and the Section 2 issue is on the table is why should we part company from the other circuits with respect to the viability of such a claim under Section 2? Because, Your Honor, that's what the plain language of Section 2 requires. Section 2 
applies to any voting qualification without exception. And it's equally plain that Washington's felon disfranchisement law is a voting qualification. Those two propositions should constitute the entirety of the analysis. That but is to what, say- But what do you do then with section four and the congressional discussion with, with the precise potential disqualification here, which is the felon disenfranchisement? It seems that we can't read section two without taking the action but you may have a way to reconcile that, and I'd appreciate hearing your view, because I think when you look at Congress having taken into account, which I thought Section 4 did, really, that's where you look at the issue of, of felon disenfranchisement, that there you have almost a specific overriding agenda. Sure, I think there are a couple of responses to Your Honor's question. The first is that the Supreme Court is cautioned against using the legislative history of one section of a statute to interpret another. So Section 4's legislative history can't be used to construe what Congress meant when it passed Section 4. Section 2, that Congress carved out an exception for felon disfranchisement in Section 4 doesn't mean that they sought to exempt from scrutiny discriminatory felon disfranchisement laws under Section 2's coverage. And our argument here, Your Honor, is that the plain language of Section 2 requires that we follow the cardinal canon of statutory interpretation, which holds that where a statute is plain on its face, the sole function of the courts is to enforce it according to its plain terms. More recently, the Supreme Court has explained that the authoritative statement of Congress's intent is found in, in the text of the statute, not in the legislative history Counsel, of the statute. Let me ask you about the plain language of the statute. It says no voting qualification or prerequisite to voting. Uh, if you just look at the words, you don't look at the history, which is what we all know that Congress was concerned with the poll taxes and literacy tests that the southern states used to disenfranchise black people from voting. Just look at the words. The uh, felon disenfranchisement is not a qualification or prerequisite. It's a disqualification for people who've previously been qualified. If we go beyond this statute and we look at not legislative history, which I agree with you is a pretty is dubious for the usual reasons, plus the reason that none of us said none of the legislative history says that they meant to get rid of felony felon disenfranchisement in sixty five or eighty two. But if we look at other statutes, the National Voter Registration Act of nineteen ninety three and the Help America Vote Act of two thousand two both have provisions requiring the federal government to assist the states in felon disenfranchisement enforcement. When I look at the package together, what I get is a history where these felon disenfranchisement laws were adopted not for the purpose of excluding black voters, but excluding white voters, because the southern states used to exclude black voters because they were black. They didn't need any indirect tricks. At all the states excluded felons. And for the states that excluded blacks from voting, every single person excluded from voting on account of felon disenfranchisement was white. Uh, I just think it's extraordinary to try to read the words which don't seem to apply in light of other legislation which makes it clear that the words don't apply and history which makes it clear that the words were never meant to apply to mean the opposite. So, Your Honor, I think that the, the text of Section 2A of the Voting Rights Act, no voting qualification or prerequisite to voting, captures pretty clearly Washington's felon disfranchisement. Why, is it, why, is why voting doesn't that just speak to qualifications like paying your poll tax and passing the literacy test as opposed to disqualification? For example, if you move out of the state, you might be disqualified from voting because you don't live there anymore. Your Honor, I think it's a, I think it's a, a distinction without a difference. The, the reality is that Washington imposes this felon disfranchisement disqualification. And Suppose if, you could prove that most of the people who left a particular state, say most of the people that left Louisiana and Mississippi and went to Chicago some time ago were black, or a much higher proportion of blacks than whites left the southern states where they were discriminated against and went to Chicago. Would that mean that leaving the state, becoming a non-resident, and therefore being disenfranchised <coughs> was prohibited? Your Honor, if, 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 as in this case, the plaintiffs were able to trace 
the discriminatory impact of the particular voting qualification to racial discrimination, they'd have a viable claim under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. People that have lived in Chicago for 10 years would still be entitled to vote in Louisiana and Mississippi because the residency, non-residency disqualification for people who leave would be covered by Section 1973. Your, Your Honor, the residency requirement is a voting qualification. But in the, the facts of your honor's hypothetical, the, the result would have to be a discriminatory one on account of race, as the plaintiffs have established in this case. As to your honor's point about looking at later congressional enactments to construe what Congress uh, intended in 1982 when they passed the law, the, the Supreme Court has also cautioned against looking at later congressional enactments for the purpose of understanding what Congress meant in 1982. The best evidence of what in we- In a different context. In a different context uh, or, they, or at a later they said, time. They said, Congress can't say in 2010 what it meant in 1973. Or in 2006 law. or 1993. The best but evidence. here Congress isn't saying what it meant. It's just passing laws that plainly require the feds to assist the states with felon disenfranchisement. Your Honor, in 1982, Congress set out to expand a law that they had previously enacted to eradicate racial discrimination from voting root and branch. And Cal Congress Council, is clear. I, I have two questions about current developments or recent developments that may or may not affect what we do, but I'd like to ask you about both of them. One is uh, the question whether the court should wait for the Supreme Court to act on the cert petition in Sivin Simmons versus Galvin from the First Circuit, which is pending and on which the Solicitor General has been asked uh, for a brief. And the second is the amendment of the Washington statute so that it, in fact it's really a prisoner disenfranchisement law because presumptively once someone is no longer incarcerated, they're generally restored their right to vote. And I wonder if you would be willing to comment on those two developments as to how they should influence our analysis. Sure, Your Honor. I, I guess my, my best uh, estimation as to the first question is that the Supreme Court may be waiting to see what, what this court does with the, this, this matter. Before <laughs> I don't think I'm sure about that. Right? Um, <laughs> you don't need to listen but, to us. <laughs> right. uh, and <laughs> right. that might mean you don't want to win here. <laughs> We've, as, as to Your Honor's second question, though, the ACLU's amicus brief points out that Washington's amended felon disfranchisement law continues to disfranchise 27,000 people who are non-incarcerated, who are currently living under community custody, which is Washington's version of, of parole. Uh, what that means, in effect, is that there are more people living, nor non-incarcerated people living under disfranchisement than there are presently incarcerated people. Uh, which there are 16,000. So Washington's amended law actually disfranchises more people who are not incarcerated than who are incarcerated. Well, which one is before us? Is the, your, your claim has to do with the, the incarcerated. original version. Yes, ma'am. Which is now mooted, right? So, I'm sorry, Your Honor? Which is now mooted. No, not at all, Your Honor. In fact, Why not? what Washington's amended law does not do is it does not alleviate the racial discrimination that's in the criminal justice system, nor does it prevent I, racial minorities from I being... I hear your argument on that. My question is, is the original statute still a live issue before us? Absolutely, Your Honor. And that's because the, the, the amended statute does not remove the discrimination from Washington's criminal justice system, nor does it alleviate racial minorities from being disproportionately denied the, the right to vote. Answer with respect to the amended statute. With respect to the amended statute, it does not cure the, the ill that we well, see currently in this case. Which, which statute is, a li is the live statute that we have to decide? Your Honor, the live statute is 29.08, uh, the, the statute that we challenge in this case. That's the, the current amended statute, amended though. Version. The amended statute has a very similar number to the, the original statute. In fact, I guess but now we can say... How can we amended? possibly make a decision about a statute that's been repealed? That's why I asked you about the provisions of the new statute. If, if there is a live controversy well, you're, remaining, I think it, sure. wouldn't it have to be about the statute as it now is? The statute as it now is, is the statute that we, that we now challenge, Your Honor. So and the, words, the, you're saying that the evidence you presented to the district court applies with equal force to our statute. That's right? right, Your Honor. And in fact, what plaintiffs have been able to show in the context of prosecution, for example, is that even considering uh, statutory standards designed to limit prosecutorial misconduct, and even in the presence of legally relevant variables, prosecutors in Washington State 
recommend that blacks are more likely to um, be charged with an offense and to receive a longer prison sentence with prosecutors recommending that blacks spend 50% more time incarcerated than similarly situated whites. Counsel, uh, I'm, still, counsel I'm still stuck at the threshold question of whether felon disenfranchisement statutes are even covered under Section 2. And I'm looking at the Supreme Court case in Richardson versus Ramirez, where the holding is that the exclusion of felons from the vote has an affirmative sanction in Section 2 of the 14th Amendment. Uh, how can we ignore that sure. expression from the Supreme Court? Your Honor, the, the plaintiffs in this case don't challenge the general validity of felon disfranchisement. What the plaintiffs challenge in this case is the impermissible role that race plays in the application of Washington's felon disfranchisement law. The Richardson case in Section 2 of the 14th Amendment don't prohibit this court from applying Section 2 to Washington's felon disfranchisement law for three reasons. Well, the first of all, S Section 2 of the 14th Amendment expressly makes an exception for crime, for conviction of crime. But, Your Honor, the 14th Amendment doesn't affirmatively sanction discriminatory felon disfranchisement laws. Washington has the authority to disfranchise some, all, or none of its felons, but it can't do so on a discriminatory basis as it's doing here. And the second reason, Your Honor, is that the 15th Amendment itself doesn't carve out an exception for felon disfranchisement. It's noteworthy to point out that the Reconstruction Era Congress expressly considered an exception for felon disfranchisement in the 15th Amendment and ultimately rejected that exception, underscoring Congress's intent to reach all voting qualifications that have discriminatory uh, results. And the third reason, as this court recently pointed out in Harvey versus Brewer, is that the absence of a constitutional prohibition doesn't bar a statutory one. Indeed, it's noteworthy to point out that Congress has historically prohibited certain types of felon disfranchisement. Again, the, re, uh, the, the Reconstruction Era Congress prohibited readmitted states from disfranchising for statutory felonies, even though the 14th Amendment provides states with the authority to disfranchise both for statutory and common law felonies. But when, this, let me go back not to the congressional intent, but the congressional language and to my question to you about reading the statute as a whole. If you have Section 4, which at the time the Voting Rights Act was adopted, of course a distinction was made between covered and non-covered jurisdictions. And it seems to me that you would have this bizarre paradox with respect to felon disenfranchisement laws under Section 4, if somehow they were meant to be included under Section 2, if you permitted them, for example, in the covered jurisdictions, and you didn't in the other jurisdictions, in the non-covered jurisdictions. So could you go back and try to reconcile how those pieces of the statute fit together, particularly given this distinction that was made and continued to be made for a long time over sure. covered versus non-covered jurisdictions. Your Honor, the, the truth is that <laughs> Sections 4 and Sections 2 are, are different sections. They, they serve different purposes and they have different language. I think the best example of what Congress intended is looking at Section 2 itself. And the best lesson to be learned from Section that 4... That doesn't answer my question. I know they're different sections because you can see they have different numbers. But they are in the same statute and you have to read the statute as a whole. So. To just simply say they're different sections and they have different words in them doesn't really answer the question of how does this fit together as a scheme to attack what, what you eloquently started out with, which is discrimination in the voting system. Well, I think the best, the best guidance we get is from the Supreme Court, Your Honor, which cautions against reading different sections of a statute to interpret another provision of the statute. The best, um, the best example to be learned from Section 4 is that where Congress sought to carve out an exception for felon disfranchisement, they did so unambiguously. And I think that we cannot read Section 4's exception for felon disfranchisement to mean that Congress <laughs> exempt discriminatory voting qualifications, like Washington's felon disfranchisement law, from scrutiny under Section 2, which Congress enacted to root out discrimination in voting root and branch. All right, I have another question. Um, if we, as sitting as the en banc court, were to reaffirm the holding of um, Barracon 1 and 2 that um, felon disenfranchisement falls within the prohibition of the RA Section 2, we would be creating a circuit split that would surely get the Supreme Court's attention. Why, um, how would you distinguish the other three circuits' reasoning from what we have before us? Sure, Your Honor. The other three circuits, the first, second, and eleventh circuits, 
were issued opinions that were vigorous dissents by members of those courts. Well, I know there were and vigorous they, dissents, they, and one of them was by Justice Sotomayor. So. Right, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I'm going to share the <laughs> Justice Sotomayor. Well, you Sotomayor. were quoting her a minute ago. So. I did. I was, I was actually going to do it again, if Your Honor doesn't mind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and, 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 and those three circuits reached those conclusions after disregarding the cardinal canon of statutory interpretation. As Justice Sotomayor, then Judge Sotomayor, in her dissent, Hayden versus Pataki, explained. It's clear to anyone reading Section 2 that it applies to all voting qualifications without exception. And it's equally clear that felon disfranchisement laws are voting qualifications. Uh, Justice Sotomayor said that those two propositions should constitute the entirety of the analysis, that a clear and unambiguous statute, which was intended to capture all voting qualifications, would apply to felon disfranchisement laws, which are voting qualifications. Well, what, I, what is the remedy that you wish here? Is, is what you're seeking in order that where a um, felon disenfranchisement Im disproportionately impacts blacks, that, um, all, that, that all felons must vote? You're right. That's right. You're right. On this record, Washington's felon disenfranchisement uh, uh, violates Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And though it arose in a different context, Hunter versus Underwood is, is helpful here in that when the U.S. Supreme Court found that Alabama's law violated the Constitution, they, they, they enjoyed operation of that law. They struck down that law as to everyone who was disfranchised under that law. The record in this case, Your Honor, requires that this court enjoin Washington's felon disfranchisement law. I, I have a question about that, um, about how to understand subsection B of section 2, because a violation is established by showing that the political processes leading to nomination or election are not equally open. And what, what you seem to be saying is that once you show that a voting standard results in a disproportionate effect on one racial group or another, that translates automatically mm -hmm. into a showing that the political process is affected and I wonder if that is correct, or if, if there is some other step that has to be gone through in an evidentiary sense, even accepting everything else you say, is, is to showing how the political process leading to nomination or election is infected by discrimination, because that seems to me a different question. Well, Your Honor, as to, the, as to our clients who allege vote denial, the political process is not open at all. The equally open uh, text here uh, it has, has, has more relevance in the context of vote dilution where we're looking at aggravate, aggregating votes uh, according to what a racial minority uh, is entitled to in influencing elections. Here, we're talking about the value of participation, and our clients don't have uh, that, that right at all, uh, don't have access to the, ba the ballot box at all. Re returning to the, the example of the, the prosecutor, uh, the evidence that, that we've shown in the context of prosecution, um, we've shown in, in, our, in this case that prosecutors recommend um, that blacks who are similarly situated to whites spend 50% more time incarcerated than for... Uh, this raises a question in my mind. It's a little hard for me to, to get it out cleanly, quickly. But the criminal justice system, unlike almost anything else I can think of in this context, uh, is a unique animal in that it has its own built-in protections. So if the prosecutor has prosecuted selectively, there is a remedy for that. Uh, if uh, the uh, investigation has been based upon evidence obtained through discriminatory means, there is a remedy for that. You can't be tried by a discriminatory jury. So once convicted, then it's not exactly that it's implicating Heck versus Humphrey, mm -hmm. but it's bumping up against the notion that you're trying to say, at the end of the day, without having achieved a remedy during the process, that in fact conviction should not have been, should not stand. You know, I don't, I don't see the plaintiff's claims here raising any Heck v. Humphrey Well, I, I didn't say it not... did. I said it just is, it's bordering on a very peculiar notion. This, but, the, but this is not a collateral attack on the plaintiff's conviction. Not here. What the, what the, what the, not, what the not plaintiffs here. are arguing here is a violation of their Section 2 rights. And I think that Senate Factor why, why 5... Why wouldn't this should... lead to that precisely? Uh, because... if, if this were upheld and there's a determination, by <laughs> final determination that the 
entire criminal justice system in the state of Washington is racially discriminatory, why wouldn't there be a launch pad for uh, collateral attacks on, on uh, judgments? If, if you are convicted by a system that is racially discriminatory, it seems to me we have a bigger problem than not voting. Because yeah, isn't that what Judge uh, Ragai uh, 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 pointed out in, in Hayden? She did, Your Honor, and that particular concern was misguided because the standard in challenging one's criminal conviction is intentional discrimination. The evidence amassed here shows that the effect of racial discrimination in the criminal justice system disproportionately denies the right to vote to I racial think, minorities. I think it follows from your argument then that felon disenfranchisement laws are fine so long as the state prosecutes, convicts more whites and, and uh, more people of other races other than I think it was blacks and Hispanics that were uh, in, in the record in this case as having disproportionate convictions. So or it's not felon disenfranchisement that's the problem. It's that, and it's not that <clears throat> the uh, defendants are innocent of the felonies and were only convicted because of racial discrimination. It's that not enough white felons are getting caught. So your argument is, I think, by implication, that felon disenfranchisement laws are just fine so long as they convict enough whites. Is that well, true? Well, argument, Your Honor, is that the states have the authority under the 14th Amendment and following the Supreme Court's ruling in Richardson v. Ramirez to disenfranchise their citizens so long as they don't do so on a discriminatory basis. But, but they don't Washington. Here. All, all felons, all felons, regardless of race, are disenfranchised. I mean, subject to this on new the law. face of the statute. That's right, Your Honor. But, but what, so, what's so, happening so, in Washington State <laughs> is that racial discrimination in the criminal justice system is being injected into the political process through the felon disenfranchisement law. And I think Senate Factor Five provides a great example of the way in which Congress wanted courts to look at the way that racial discrimination is shifted from external things, external factors from the voting process into the political process. But shouldn't we use, you know, the, the district court here in looking at the evidence looked at more than Senate Factor 5. Um, is it your position that Senate Factor 5 is the bellwether in a case like this and that if you're correct on the remedy being available, that the court shouldn't look to the other Senate factors? Your Honor, Congress intended for the list of Senate factors to be considered in their totality, applying those factors that are relevant to a particular case at hand. And Congress is clear that no single Senate factor is dispositive. What's interesting about what the district court did was it held on its own that Senate factors 2, 3, 4, and 6 are irrelevant in the context of vote denial, but proceeded to, proceeded to consider the, con, proceeded to count them against uh, the plaintiffs in any event. And the Supreme Court explained that the majority of the Senate factors are particularly pertinent in the context of vote dilution, as almost all of them look to the effectiveness of votes cast by racial minorities, not to the question of whether minorities have access to the ballot at all. You have about three minutes left. Did you want to save? I yes, Your Honor, I wanted to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Well, I have, have three minutes now. I'll reserve the balance we'll give you of my time. Look at three. Thanks, Your Honor. Okay, we'll hear from the state now. Chief Judge Kaczynski, and may it please the court, I'd like to begin with the question of whether the Voting Rights Act applies to felon disenfranchisement. We believe strongly that it does not, which is exactly the conclusion reached by the first, second, and eleventh circuit courts of appeal. First, I'm sorry, would you state your name for the record? I'm sorry, I, I, Attorney General Rob McKenna, State of Washington. Welcome. In the first instance, the plain language of the Voting Rights Act makes it clear that it does not apply to felon disenfranchisement. Appellants focus on the language in Section 2A, but the Supreme Court made it clear in Chisholm v. Romer, a VRA case involving the election of judges, that one must read Section 2A and 2B together. And one, when one reads Section 2B, you see how to apply Section 2A. 2B is the language which refers to the political processes and whether they're equally open to participation by members of a class of citizens protected by subsection A and refers to their opportunity to participate in the political process. As the subsection, Hayden, subsection A states the type of rule, qualification, prerequisite, standard practice or procedure that could be covered if the proof exists. B is about what you have to prove. Correct. But it's not about where, in, in theory, what kinds of things that proof can pertain to. So why isn't a law of this kind 
one of the following, a voting qualification, a prerequisite to voting, a standard, a practice, or a procedure? For the purposes of the Voting Rights Act, none of that language applies to felon disenfranchisement. We think the plain language... That's the... Well, <laughs> that, that's, that's sort of the ultimate answer that you want us to come to, but right. I don't... But it's not an explanation. Why, well, the, why isn't a law that says that people who have <coughs> certain status or have engaged in certain behavior are no longer entitled to vote, why doesn't that count as a standard practice or procedure related to voting? Because the Congress did not intend for it to apply uh, to get to convicted felons. The right to vote does not extend to felons in the first instance. They have, they have lost their right to vote previously and therefore not within that class of citizens who have a meaningful opportunity to participate in the political process. This is exactly the conclusion reached by the Hayden Court and the Simmons Court. But wait a second, why do they not have the right? They don't have the right because of the felon disenfranchisement. Right. So that's not an answer, that's a circular response. Right. No, I, I, I just... That's like saying you can't read, therefore you can't vote, therefore you're not covered. Except that unlike literacy tests, Judge McEwen, uh, felon disenfranchisement is sanctioned in Amendment 14, Section 2. That's and has a been different question. I think you're saying that good moral character is, in fact, a qualification for voting. Is that right? I am not. Good moral character is expressly addressed as being impermissible under Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act. That's the section where you would expect Congress would have addressed felon disenfranchisement if they intended to do so. So you don't have to have that good a moral character, but you have to have non-felonious moral character. The Congress made it clear and that... You say that is a qualification, but because they didn't mean that, uh, the, 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 it shouldn't count. Judge Klein, the language of the Washington State Constitution refers to losing the right to vote for uh, committing felonies. That's the issue here. It's not a question of moral character. Moral character isn't the language that's used in our state constitution or our state statutes. It is language that was addressed by the Congress in Section 4 of the Voting Rights I don't think you understood the thrust of, or, or why I was asking the question. I understood your argument to concede that not having committed a felony was, in fact, a voting qualification. And for your argument not really to be a plain language argument, even though you characterized it that way, mm -hmm. but a legislative intent argument based on other things. And I'm trying to find out exactly what it is. The, the reason we think that the plain language of Section 2 does not bring felon disenfranchisement within its scope is the language in Section 2 be taken with Section 2A, because the language refers to the goal of Congress to see that citizens have an opportunity to participate, uh, and they want to know whether the challenged uh, qualification or practice... Uh, it says it's uh, violations established mm -hmm. if based on a totality of the circumstances... Correct. ...the processes are not equally open to participation by members of... Uh, class protected by subsection A. Yes, Your Honor. And in the Hayden Simmons Court, they and pointed out the obvious the fact that felons members have less opportunity to participate. Well, you really can't go in there holding up signs for your favorite candidate and calling people on a phone telling them to vote for them if you're in prison. Correct. They do, since they're in jail, they don't have a meaningful opportunity to participate in the, in the political process. I, I wanna, I'm sorry. So is it a plain language argument? We, we do, in the first instance, make a plain language argument, what, which is, which is also is what the Hayden Simmons you? courts do, but this, those courts also do choose to examine the legislative history, and so we address the legislative history in our brief as well, because it apparently was relevant by the other, some of the other courts that have looked at the question. I, I would like to present you with a hypothetical. Let's suppose there is a state that has never had a law like this before, and the... Uh, legislators say, well, we know we can't have a poll tax anymore, we know we can't have literacy tests anymore, but there's a really, really good way to keep racial minorities from having their fair share of the political process. We'll pass a felon disenfranchisement law for the express purpose of making sure that we have fewer minority voters. It, is that something that is covered by Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act or not? And if not, why not? 
it would be covered by the 14th and 15th Amendments in the first instance. This is pretty much the situation of Hunter v. Underwood, where the Supreme Court didn't have to reach the Voting Rights Act in 1985. They simply looked to equal protection under the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment's explicit prohibition on voter discrimination. So one would not even reach the voter right, Voting Rights Act because where there's intentional discrimination, you would refer, first of all, to the 14th and 15th Amendments. Uh, and therefore, that would, you know, Therefore, you wouldn't need to go to the Voting Rights Act because... But if you did, what would you find out? That it is also prohibited by statute or that it is not? If there were a finding of intentional discrimination, even though the Voting Rights Act no longer requires a finding of intentional discrimination, then it's conceivable that a court could say, yes, this violates the Voting Rights Act as well as the 14th and 15th Amendments. But I don't think they would reach that question. So the real question, though, I mean, I, I guess what I'm trying to figure out here is whether you're saying... In theory, it's possible. There just isn't any proof here that the political process has been tainted in the way that is forbidden by Section 2B, or whether you're saying, don't even think about that Judge, question. Judge Graber, it's not hypothetical in this case. The, there was a 14th Amendment equal protection claim and a 15th Amendment claim made in this case. It was dismissed by the district court back in 1997. It was not appealed. It was no longer before the court. The district court found expressly no intentional discrimination in Washington. And the, more, and the district court in 2006 found, looking at the totality of circumstances, a, quote, remarkable absence of any history of official discrimination in Washington. That sounds like a Section 2B factual argument to me and not a theoretical argument. It, 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 I am referring to the district court's conclusions based on the evidence before it. Yes, Your Honor. So, so what do you make of the findings? So, so your position is there's no intentional discrimination in this case in passing the uh, vote, felon disenfranchisement, the, the voting provision. But now we go one step back, and I'm now looking at the district court's order. Do you, do you have it handy, or do you remember it? Well. This is page 10 of the district court's uh, order, uh, where the district court says, and, and I had some of this discussion with opposing counsel. Uh, this says the court finds both of these reports to be compelling evidence of racial discrimination and bias in Washington's criminal justice system. And there's a footnote, which is uh, I'm sure you're familiar with. Yes, footnote 7, Your Honor. Uh, and, uh, it says, uh, uh, contrary to the defendant's assertion, that these reports are based solely on statistics and are thus insufficient evidence of a VR, for a VRA claim, the court finds these experts' conclusions drawn from the available statistical data admissible, relevant, persuasive. Now, my question, my specific question is, is this a finding of intentional discrimination by the state of Washington in the administration of its criminal justice system? No, Chief Judge Kaczynski, it is not. It is a finding of sufficient statistical evidence to conclude that factor five applies in this case. Then the court went so, on, of So course, you agree to... with opposing counsel that this is a mere disparity finding? This is not an intentional uh, uh, discrimination finding? Because it, Correct. It, it, I, I have some, I had read it differently. Because when you talk of racial discrimination, uh, discrimination, uh, connotes, to my mind, an active uh, state of mind, as opposed to disparity, something that merely happens, a difference between two things. Discrimination suggests an intent to separate one thing from another. And so I had read that sentence as a finding of intentional discrimination in the administration of the, of the, of the criminal justice system in, in the state of Washington. You don't read it that way, and I, get, I gather that, that um, Opposing counsel doesn't either, and I, I, I'm a little, you're, I'm, I'm not sure I'm entirely persuaded by that, but, uh, um, you, Your Honor, I, the, if, if there is no intentional discrimination here, and both counsel agree with that, right. then without intentionality either at the, uh, regarding the voting uh, requirement, and that has to do with, with felons, or intentionality with respect to the administration of the criminal justice system, how do you get a coverage by, uh, under, under Section 2? We don't believe that the statistical, statistical disparities and the disproportionality cited by the district court brings our statute within uh, the coverage of Section 2. We don't agree with the district court's conclusion well, that Factor there were, 5 was there violated. Were, let's say unquestionably there were disparities. Uh, let's decide. 
And I understand you dispute that vigorously. Yeah. You believe there's not sufficient evidence for that, and we, we can discuss that. But I, I, I'm right now, let's say we put that question aside and there were undisputed or quite clear evidence that the criminal justice system operates in a disparate, uh, although not discriminatory, although not intentionally discriminatory manner. And I, what I'm asking is, is that enough to, uh, to, 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 uh, to uh, trigger a Section 2 violation? No, we don't believe it is, Your Honor. In fact, the, this court in Salt River and several other district courts in cases like Ortiz, Irby, Salas, Burton, all concluded that statistical disparities enough are simply not enough to establish a VRA claim. Uh, and uh, what the judge below did in his, in, says in his footnote is he analogizes to employment discrimination suits in which disproportionate impact is the correct standard under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. It is not, however, the appropriate standard under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, where you have to show, uh, you have to apply a results test, and you have to show a causal connection between the challenge voting practice assuming it is a, challenge, a voting practice or qualification and the evidence that you have. And this simply has not been the case here. In fact, even where dis disparities are cited by the, uh, the expert witnesses, they explain away most of the disparities. They say most of the disparities are explainable by legally relevant factors. Secondly, Crutchfield, who conducted the survey of all the studies, said, quote, these studies are not designed to uncover causes of discrimination. So what we're left with is a set of experts who say, well, we don't think we can explain it by legally relevant factors, so we're going to assume that, this is the re that the remaining disparity is the result of discrimination without actually proving the discrimination because, as Crutchfield points out, these cases that, that's, that's how we often make decisions in real life. As Sherlock Holmes said, when you exclude all the impossible possibilities, then the improbable is only, must be true because it's only, you know, when we operate that way in real life, we say uh, you, you, you have evidence of certain things, you sometimes can get positive proof of something, and you say, well, what are the likely causes? And it's not this likely cause, it's not this likely cause, it's this likely cause. We therefore, well, life is finite and uh, possibilities are infinite, and you move on by saying it must be this other thing. Why is not that a perfectly appropriate way for the experts to operate in this case? Because Congress said it's not, Your Honor, for purposes of the Voting Rights Act. Congress applied a totality of circumstances test which other courts have read to mean disparities alone simply are not enough. One must look to the totality of circumstances which the Farrakhan II panel simply refused to do. They refused to look beyond factor five, dismissing the analysis of the other factors which are relevant, which the district court did analyze in concluding that under the totality of circumstances, even though he did find compelling evidence of, uh, based on these statistical disparities, he concluded that under the totality of circumstances, our felon disenfranchisement law does not violate the Voting Rights Act. So well, one I one thing that's um, interesting about the district court opinion is that significantly defendants, meaning the state of Washington, do not present any evidence to refute plaintiffs' experts' conclusions. So is, is, is that an accurate statement of the facts that the state was just willing to go with its legal argument in effect? Judge McEwen, we, we did focus on our legal argument, but we have also pointed out the fact that all these studies show are statistical disparities, most of which are explained away. We repeatedly observe in our briefing that the experts themselves explain away most of the disparities. But secondly, and more importantly, it's not enough to prove the VRA applies to felon disenfranchisement, even if one assumed that it were enough to prove factor five, which we disagree with. And that's, of course, the conclusion the district court reached, that even though he found, that district court judge found that there was enough under factor five, it certainly wasn't enough to apply uh, the VRA to Washington felon disenfranchisement under the totality of the circumstances test, because he did look at the other relevant factors. Did the state so let, me, let me just ask you, this is a question, but <coughs> if one assumed without deciding that there is a claim under Section 2, what would be your position? 
We would, we would argue that the evidence is not sufficient under Section 2 to conclude that our felon disenfranchisement statute in application uh, violates, the, or uh, under the totality of circumstances, violates the Voting Rights Act. I mean, for example, the, the, one of the figures that the appellants rely on heavily is this, this ratio of 9.3 to 1, the ratio of African Americans who are incarcerated to those who are uh, in the po general population, yet that's a 1980 figure. If you look at the numbers in the last few years, that ratio has dropped by more than 50 percent, indicating a responsiveness of the uh, judicial and political systems of Washington State. Secondly, most of the studies that they rely on are studies that were commissioned by Washington State itself, by the Washington Minority and Justice Commission, which was created expressly to address concerns about disproportionality in our criminal justice system. Or a study by the Washington State Patrol, commissioned expressly because of concerns raised over racial profiling, or a study commissioned by the state legislature in response to the Christensen 1980 study, which has resulted in several amendments to state law that have had the effect, amendments to uh, sentencing, uh, amendments requiring that uh, the judges write down the reasons for applying an exceptional sentence. The totality of, uh, or the, the overall effect of all of these amendments uh, has been to contribute to a more than 50% reduction in disproportionality uh, by 2005, which has continued to present day. Is that on the record? Uh, I would, we cite to uh, ER 189 for the original 9.3 to 1 ratio. We cite to ER 130 for the 2005 ratio for African Americans, which had dropped to 4.22. We, uh, we do not have the 2007 figures uh, in, in the record, although they're based in part on U.S. Census data, which, of course, the court can take judicial notice of. Have you asked us to? I'm sorry, Your Honor? You, the, the facts that you're giving us right now, are they properly in front of us? We believe they are, Your Honor, based on the, uh, the uh, census data from the prisons and from the U.S. Census, which are already in the record. You asked yes. us to take judicial notice of that? I would ask you to take judicial notice of the fact that there's been a more than 50% decline in disproportionality for African Americans. No basis to do that. You would have to file a proper motion and... The, the uh, Sentencing Commission, which, which is, uh, the court may take judicial notice of, is the source of these statistics in the first instance, Your Honor. Well, thank, and that you. It, thank you, co-counsel. Let me ask you something else. What evidence did the state put on in its summary um, judgment uh, papers as to the other Senate factors, the other than, um, Senate Factor 5? Your Honor, we brought in uh, uh, evidence uh, from Dr. Quintard Taylor's analysis of our state's favorable a history of favorable civil rights legislation dating back to 1890. We brought we made the point that no evidence has been uh, provided of racially polarized voting under Factor Two. No evidence of at-large elected districts. No evidence of denial of access. No evidence of any occurrences of overt or subtle racial appeals under Factor Six. We showed that uh, Washington voters supported President Obama in 2008. Elected. A America's first Chinese American governor on the mainland, elected an African American to be ex chief executive of the largest county in our state, elected an African American to be the mayor of the largest city in our state. We also provide evidence uh, regarding responsiveness. The fact that the 2009 amendments to our disenfranchisement law were adopted is evidence of this, uh, ch of what, this what responsiveness. Is, what is your response to the uh, issue that I raised earlier about, uh, and that Judge Reimer also had questions about? <laughs> 2009 statutory form that is presently before us for analysis, assuming that there is a claim in existence, um, is, is that the version of the law? And if so, what is your response to opposing counsel's argument that that amendment has only made things worse? Uh, Your Honor, we believe that the current version of the law as amended in 2009 is the version of the law before this court for the purposes of this case because the relief that's being sought uh, is to effectively enjoin the, the current law. So it must be the current law which is before the court which is, was amended in 2009. Uh, secondly, uh, I don't believe that opposing counsel said that the amendments have made things worse. I think what he said is that there are still a lot of people who are disenfranchised 
uh, who, are who are not, not incarcerated, incarcerated, who are supervised. Uh, it, it, a majority of the states which disenfranchise felons disenfranchise them while they're in prison and while they're on community supervision or parole. Oh, that is the most common practice in, in the United States today. And the reason for that is the policy decision that because they're still on community supervision, they can be pulled back into prison at any time if they violate the terms of their release. And therefore, the policy decision has been made not to allow them to re-register, only to have their voting registration invalidated because they've been pulled back. It would be very difficult to administer such a system since some of the individuals on supervision are, are in and out of, of jail while they're on supervision for um, minor or large violations of their supervised release. So the state of Washington legislature, in greatly reducing the number of felons affected by our disenfranchisement law with the 2009 amendments, did make the policy decision to, to keep supervised felons as well as incarcerated felons within the scope of our state law. How does it apply to federal felons? Federal felons are not covered by our law. If they, are, if they move into our state, uh, or we're in our state to begin with, and they're on par federal parole, they can register to vote. They're not covered by the law. The, the, the language of the statute uh, refers expressly to those individuals on supervision who are convicted in a state court of Washington. So similarly, uh, Chief Judge Kaczynski, if a convicted felon moves into our state from another state, and, it, and is still on parole from that other state, they're not covered by our law, they're not disenfranchised in Washington. That's so section all the one. felons should move, the former felons should move to Washington? Or is that <laughs> <laughs> no, th they want to no, thank you, Judge McEwen. Counsel, you argue that the Voting Rights Act does not apply to the felon disenfranchisement laws, but I hear Mr. Haygood in his argument saying, well, you know, it really doesn't matter that um, so far as this case is concerned, and, and putting aside for a moment whether the evidence is substantial or not, there has been a showing of discrimination and that's enough. What's your response? Judge O'Scannon, we don't believe that uh, it, it is enough to suddenly bring our felon disenfranchisement law within the ambit of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, because we don't believe Congress intended it to apply uh, unless there's a showing of intentional discrimination as in Hunter v. Underwood. So we could conceive of a scenario, and we actually discussed a hypothetical a few minutes ago, about where the court would be asked to consider a felon disenfranchisement law evidently enacted for intentionally discriminatory purposes. In that case, one would not reach the VRA because one, the court, as the court did in Hunter v. Underwood, would address it under the 14th and 15th Amendments. With, and, and of course, the Supreme Court in Hunter did not refer to the Counsel, VRA. The they simply addressed with it. That argument is that we have that very case right now in front of us because the district court here did dismiss the 14th and 15th Amendment right. claims and we're left with the Voting Rights Act claim. So the case you're saying can't possibly occur is the one you're arguing right No, Your now. Honor, with all respect, what I said is the case involving intentional discrimination is not the case before us. As you said, that's been ruled out. And the, the evidence before us here is merely evidence of statistical disparities. It's not what, enough. What happens if we disagree with counsel on both sides and read uh, that sentence that I refer to on page 10 of the district court's order as a finding of intentional discrimination in the administration of the criminal justice system? Uh, leaving in place the assumption we've made that there was no discrimination in the passage of the felon disenfranchisement law. So uh, no, no intention to discriminate there, but intentional discrimination in administration of the criminal justice system. Your Honor, in, in, in that scenario, then we would ask the court to look at the other uh, factors and conduct a complete totality of the circumstances analysis, which the Farrakhan II panel declined to do. And we believe you would reach the same conclusion as... But you asked us the same thing when I asked you about uh, disparity. And you said disparity, you still have to look at the other factors. Dis disparity uh, is not proof of intentionality. You, you're, you're, the hypothetical you just addressed to me was the hypothetical in which you said, well, what if we concluded that no, no, they I, did I, find I understand. We, we, you said we should read the sentence as merely showing disparity, and then you go and you balance the other factors. So now I've said to you, well, what if we read this as intentional? And you gave me the be, same answer. You said we go and balance the other factors as well. You, Chief Judge Kaczynski, what I hoped I said, and I thought I said, was that if it's mere statistical disparity, then we're not even proving factor five here. The courts have been very clear that have looked at Voting Rights Act cases that uh, if it's a mere statistical disparity, y you don't prove even that one factor. I, 
I see. I may have misunderstood the question, but I think this is ships passing in the night here. I, I think if I understood the thrust of the Chief Judge's question, it's suppose the felon disenfranchisement statute was passed with no intention of discriminating, and at the time in the 1860s when the first version was passed, no effect of discriminating. Uh, but the criminal justice system now was discriminating so that the effect of the combination of the two was, as a practical matter, to have a disproportionate exclusionary effect on, on uh, uh, the rights of some to participate in the political process. You, Do you need a factual inquiry? Is this merely a legal inquiry? What? I think there would have to be proof provided by the appellants that the results test, that felonless and franchise is being operated on account of race to deny the vote for that to come in, Your Honor. I, I don't but, think they but, sat but I But then you run into this problem of the 1982 change in Section 1973 to the language which results in. Yes, Your Honor. The 1982 amendments are clearly aimed at the bold and plurality opinion of the, yeah, of the U.S. Of Supreme Court, and they say intentionality is no longer the test. Rather, results are the test. But courts who have looked at that very language have said, wait a minute, you don't satisfy the results just by showing us statistical disparities. They, they, the, the, the courts have expressly but the ruled that out. The case uh, that you were asked about is an intent to discriminate in criminal law enforcement, some They're, bad sheriff or whoever is in charge of law enforcement tells all the, all the deputies that work for him, ignore all those white suburbs. Uh, they're all well-behaved, nice folks. Just enforce the law in the black areas. Except there's no evidence of that occurring, Judge Kleinfeld. Let's suppose case. hypothetically there mm -hmm. was. Then, then, Judge Kleinfeld, one would still need to look to the totality of circumstances. I mean, the, the, even looking at How factor, would you read it? Well, first of all, I would, I would look at the language of Factor Five itself because analyzing discrimination in the criminal justice system picks up a slice of the social and historical circumstances and the, sort of the broad environment that Factor V refers to, but doesn't necessarily even rise to a sufficient level for Factor V itself. Secondly, one would look at the amount of evidence. Even in this case, where they have statistical disparities and no intentionality shown, they explain away uh, at, you know, 80 percent of the disparities with legally relevant factors. We well, that, don't believe that- That really that goes to the posture of this case if we were to take it as it came to us district, which was a grant of summary judgment for the defendant, the state, and a denial of the plaintiff. So in the context of that, the district court uses two different words. It says the evidence sufficient. I can't tell if that's because you're looking at it favorable or under a summary judgment fashion. And then the court below also goes on to state that it's compelling. So how do you reconcile <laughs> language in light of the procedural posture in which the case comes up to us. I, I believe that for purposes of summary judgment, you know, the favorable uh, to the plaintiffs and concluded that factor five uh, is, it's, it, the test is met for purposes of bringing felonous enfranchisement in Washington within the scope of the VRA, but then went on to analyze all of the other factors which are relevant uh, under the factors test and looking at the totality of circumstances concluded that no, even though we, we, he finds some compelling evidence in this one part of the Washington state system, he doesn't find it anywhere else in well, the one system. One of the questions I have is how, how anyone can find anything from the experts' reports when each side is presenting them to say different things in terms of the magnitude of disparities, the geographic coverage of disparities, the crime coverage, and all the other things you listed a variety of ways in which you believe the state refuted those. Is, is that something at that juncture that should have been decided on summary judgment? I mean, both sides moved to summary judgment, I recognize. Yeah. But is this really a summary judgment case in this context? We think that it is, Your Honor, in the sense that even, even looking at their evidence in the most favorable light, given the absence of any proof of intentionality, uh, and given the fact that even the statistical disparities are largely explained by legally relevant factors according to their own experts, that they simply don't prove factor five. But even if, assuming for the sake of argument, factor five is proved, you have to look at the other factors as well, which the district court did, and concluded uh, in, in that sentence that you know, uh, the remarkable absence of any history of official discrimination. It, it, the district court did not seem to have a difficult time concluding that our felon disenfranchisement law 
isn't within the ambit of the VRA because of all the overwhelming weight of these other factors. So I, I think, in, in summary, Your Honor, I think the district court judge is willing to give them the benefit of the doubt on, on factor five. But he said, look, even if we give them factor five, we have compelling evidence, the rest of the factors overwhelm factor five in concluding that Washington's law doesn't come within the Voting Rights Act or doesn't violate the Voting Rights Act. When a case comes up to us on summary judgment, but the substantive law uh, contemplates uh, totality of the circumstances, balancing the factors analysis. What is our standard of review? I believe it's de novo, uh, Judge Klein or Judge uh, Reimer. But uh, I, of course, we argue in the first instance that the VRA doesn't apply. So one, the court does not have to reach that uh, part of the case in order to conclude that the state law is not within the ambit You're saying of the VRA. we rebalance de novo. I, I think that the court does not need to does not need to reach it because the VRA okay. does not apply to our state law. Mm. Clearly, under the plain language, under the legislative history, <laughs> under the congruence and proportionality, te, our, our standard of the Supreme Court, the clear statement rule, all of it. It's you simply, and none of the other d circuit courts, of course, have reached it either. Thank you. Mr. Haygood, you have three minutes. Your Honor, the, the record in this case, which is uncontested, reflects compelling evidence of racial discrimination in the criminal justice system. Disparity, that not discrimination. Discrimination, Your Honor. Uh, on account intentional of race. discrimination? Not intentional discrimination. Unintentional discrimination. discrimination. Say that again, Your Honor. You said unintentional? Discrimination on account of race. That re, the, um, Our argument is that the the impact of Washington's felon disfranchisement law disparate results, impact, impact, results in discrimination on account disparity, of race. not discrimination. Your Honor, it's more than disparity. It, it, what the disparities here reflect, as the district court explained, is racial discrimination. That these disparities arise from and result in discrimination on account of race. And it's noteworthy to point I'm out. I'm not sure Your Honor, you're, you're, you're mincing words. Uh, either there is an intent to discriminate. This is a, I had this conversation with you earlier and with opposing counsel. So either the, the system in Washington, the criminal justice system, intentionally discriminates based on race, or the Your other Honor, possibility is that there are disparities with no intent. Congress it's got to be one, amended, one, one or the other. Or the Congress other. expressly amended the Voting Rights Act in 1982. I'm to asking you which, I'm, I'm not asking about Congress. I'm asking you which you think. That Section uh, 2 doesn't require an intent test, Your Honor. And what the evidence shows And there's here, no intent, then. Doesn't require intent. The showing the, here is that these you what disparities the situation reflect. Is here. Say it again, Your Honor. What do you think the situation is here? Is there, is there disparity or discrimina intentional discrimination? There's racial discrimination, Your Honor. And counsel, what the plaintiffs have shown here, as the district court recognized, is compelling evidence of counsel, racial discrimination. Counsel, let's suppose that that's true. And let's suppose that when we read Section 1973 of Title 42, we read A and B, both of them, at we look at totality of the circumstances. What I'm wondering is whether history is one of the circumstances within the totality. As I understand it, all of the states, since the beginning of their existence, have excluded felons from voting. And in fact, I believe that until recently, all democracies have, starting with Athens, uh, is that among the circumstances that can be considered in the totality of circumstances? History is one of the considerations, Your Honor. But again, the challenge here is not to the general validity of felon disfranchisement laws, either historically or in the present. The challenge is the way in which race plays an impermissible role in the application of Washington's felon disfranchisement law. And it's important to recognize that notwithstanding the substantial record assembled here, the defendants have never contested any aspect of the plaintiff's evidence, notwithstanding opposing counsel's pronouncements today. None of the facts raised by the what do you make state of their are argument? in the record. Say it again, what, Your Honor. What do you make of their argument that without intentional discrimination uh, in the criminal justice system, you don't get factor five at all? You Your know, Honor, that, that, that's not supported by the text of section two. Section two is a results test. And what the plaintiffs have shown here, for example, in the context of prosecution, Prosecutors essentially recommend a period of disfranchisement that's 50 percent longer for blacks than for similarly situated whites. That result, if Washington's law said that on its face 
It would violate in section two. In which sense are they sim test. similarly situated? Say it again, Your Honor. In what sense are they similarly situated? This you is controlling for all past criminal convictions where there have been aggravating factors, if appropriate. These these are similarly situated blacks and whites who are treated very differently by Washington's criminal justice system. And in particular, in the context of prosecution, prosecutors recommend that similarly situated blacks spend 50% more time incarcerated than similarly situated whites. In the context of voting, this means that prosecutors where, where, where recommend a period of disfranchisement that's 50% longer for blacks where, than for similarly situated whites. And that you, violates can, Section 2's results test, Your Honor. Can you give us a record size for that? Sure, Your Honor. That's record 213-214. I like ER, ER, ER 213-214. And that's just one aspect of plaintiff's un evidence here, which the district court credited as compelling evidence of racial discrimination in the criminal justice system that injects inequality into the political process, such that in Washington state, an astonishing 24% of African American men and 15% of the entire black population are disfranchised. The arguments made by opposing counsel today aren't in the record. What this court has for it is a closed record reflecting compelling evidence of racial discrimination impacting voting. The only question in this case is whether this compelling evidence entitles plaintiffs to summary judgment as a matter of law. And as the Supreme Court explained in Beard v. Banks, the, the defendant's failure to contest any aspect of our evidence assumes its legitimacy, assumes okay. its veracity. Thank you. Thanks, Your Honor. Case is you will stand submitted. We are adjourned. You put that. Tonight, a Medal of Honor ceremony at the White House for Chief Master Sergeant Richard Etchberger. Also, a dinner hosted by the Log Cabin Republicans, an advocacy organization for gays.